time on Mr. Jarhead Game Reviews. Be sure to leave more nice words to be featured in the next video, hopefully not in two months from now. Oh, God damn it! not again. Thank you so much for the monstrous support on my Crash 4 review. Leave a comment to be featured in the beginning of the next video as well, and I'd like to give thanks to my beautiful patrons, Dauber underscore, Stin, Dano, Dotman, and Jesse. With that said... Here's Jack 3. From wholesome stretchy boy to edgy emo elf man, the Jack and Daxter series underwent a dramatic transformation, jumping from the first game to the second, and actually pulled off the tremendous shift in tone incredibly well. By this point, the big dog, shut up Michael Cole, Naughty Dog had easily established themselves as one of the top developers in the game with the rousing success of the Crash Bandicoot trilogy, along with its high octane kart racer spinoff, and now these bad boys. So I was stoked to see what the concluding entry in the Jack trilogy had in store for me, and well, to be frank? Frank. This is the first time Naughty Dog kind of disappointed me. Bad dog. Much like Jack 2, we're immediately thrust into the action with Jack being deserted in the desert by order of the Grand Council of Haven City because of his heinous acts and crimes. What heinous acts and crimes? Oh, so because Jack worked for King Dee, Dee Diabetes and that fat fuck let in a bunch of metalheads, suddenly it's our fault. Even though we killed that fat shit and the metalhead leader. And who are you? Who's even in this Grand Council? Who are you, bitch? Ashlyn tried to stick up for us, but her protest was overruled, even though later on in the game... I hereby dissolve the city council and strip you of your title, command, and all privileges. Why didn't you do that before, you goddamn scaling triangle, I bitch? Okay, okay. I'm getting really... Heated. So this prick, Count Vegan, it's Vega. kicks Jack out of Haven City, as I said, for his heinous <laughs> crime, and claims he's a danger as a dark eco-freak, but come on, buddy, that thing never gets used anyway. Daxter and Pecker voluntarily join Jack in the desert, and the group starts phasing in and out of consciousness from the scorching desert heat. I don't really know why Pecker's here, but anyway, we're treated to this flashback of Haven City being attacked by both a surviving group of metalheads and Crimson Guard deathbots who have found an unknown new leader after the demise of the Baron. During the citywide assault, the Haven Palace is bombarded bombarded and completely destroyed in an unforgettable display. I legit went holy shit when I saw this. We then cut back to the present with the gang being scooped up by this mysterious group out in the wasteland thanks to this beacon Ashlyn snuck us and the trio is brought back to the home of these people, Spargus City. And this guy Damus is the king. Damus explains to Spargus' refuge for those who were also exiled from Haven City. The king decides that the two must compete in arena battles to prove their worth and earn citizenship, as Spargus is a place which values strength and survival above all. And for some reason, Dax Dexter's surprised that they have to fight people, even though that's what we've been doing the last two games. Uh, I know Daxter's there to be the haha -ha funny man, but this was just stupid. And uh, Pecker is this guy's new advisor now too, so that's cool. I guess. What is definitely cool, however, is the morph gun making its triumphant return here in the arena. Initially, it's only equipped with the scatter mod. However, once you complete the arena challenge, you're rewarded with the infamously overpowered blaster mod. And if you thought the blaster was OP in Jack 2, just you wait to see what's in store here. There's now the beam reflexor variant, which functions the same as the regular blaster, only now the bullets ricochet off the enemies as well as walls. It doesn't even cost you any more ammo to use this form of the weapon, so you'll never be going back to the standard blaster again. Later Later on, you also get the Gyro Burster variant, which is this hovering turret that sprays bullets in all directions, which is pretty redundant and overpowered, but come on, it's pretty fun. The Scattergun and Vulcan Fury each get respectable upgrades as well, but the granddaddy of all upgrades come with the Peacemaker, featuring the Mass Inverter, which, like... <laughs> what the fuck? And then there's the Supernova, and... Yeah. And again, yes, the weapons are incredibly overpowered, but while I appreciate the challenge and the satisfaction that came with Jack 2's more strategic, hard-fought approach to combat, come on, I'd be lying if I said this wasn't fun too. As if the base upgrades to your guns weren't enough, you can improve them even further using precursor orbs for higher damage, a faster rate of fire, better ammo efficiency, and more. If you remember in Jack 2, you could obtain these through side missions or just by finding them throughout the world, and you could use the orbs for dumb little things like toggling off Jack's goatee, and while you can still do that, here they have much more of an impact on the gameplay itself, being used as currency to up your arsenal. <laughs> but my favorite thing to use the orbs for is to unlock these model viewers that come with interviews with the cast. It's amazing. It's just all part of the package, baby. That's just who I am. I just gotta reach down inside and as a bad guy, I felt I needed to stay in character, you know? Keep my emotional distance. You can't be friends with the good guys. Besides, 
Most of them were pussies anyway. So back at the arena, Jack also earns his first gym badge and a gate pass so that he can travel freely in and out of the city. Cleaver says if we can catch some lizards, he'll let us drive one of his buggies. That is, if Damus ever lets you leave the city. Even though Damus literally just gave us a gate pass two minutes ago to be able to leave the city, you dunderhead. Ah! Regardless, we venture all throughout the town on these leaper creatures to catch these lizards, and they function the exact same as the flut flut from Jack 1, which I fucking loved. So I'm really happy they're basically bad now even if they're only really used to travel through Spargus. I gotta say, Spargus is a much more enjoyable hub than Haven City. <laughs> Haven was just so congested. The zoomers didn't control the best, but even if you were good at driving them, it didn't really matter because you'd be constantly bumping into people anyway, and then you'd have to drive away from these crimson cocks. Not to mention a lot of it was just unpleasant to look at, like... Spargus, however, has much less traffic, so you don't have to worry about being chased by the cops every time you go outside. These little devils handle way better than those pesky hover cars. And a nice desert village by the shore is just much more appealing to the eye than some soulless industrialized nightmare. But that's also, like, the point. So... Dumbass! After catching those lizards, Cleaver challenges us to a race, and if we win, we can keep his tough puppy. But honestly, buddy, you can keep this piece of shit. It is so goddamn slow and crazy sensitive. But get used to it, because you'll be driving buggies a ton. There are several vehicles you unlock along the way, such as the Sand Shark, which is thankfully much faster and has a turret equipped. The Dune Hopper, which projects itself high into the air and also has a grenade launcher. The Gila... Gila... Oh, fucking damn it. Stomper, which has a massive, heavy machine gun turret and there's even more to unlock in the secrets menu but i didn't bother because you either have to use the sand shark or dune hopper like 90 percent of the time anyway so i was just like yeah. but it's really cool how they have different dune buggies designed for unique styles of missions like how the hopper has to be used to access this temple the stomper is used for some heavy duty gunning of the wasteland metalhead nest and the speedy sand shark is used for fast-paced desert combat against marauders when racing for desert artifacts and partaking in rescue missions and let me tell you not only do the desert sandstorms become a pain, but those marauders get really goddamn annoying. In one of the scavenging missions, we actually find some of Mars armor, which is part of the new health upgrade mechanic this game introduces, which would have come in handy much more in Jack 2, because this game isn't even half as hard considering the adaptive difficulty, more frequent checkpoints, absurdly powerful guns, and more OP shit like Dark Jack and the newly introduced Light Jack. You may have noticed in the health indicator the sort of yin and yang thing going on with this purple meter and this white one. The dark meter, of course, represents the dark eco you harvest, which you obviously use to become Dark Jack, who I guess is slightly improved this time around, though I still feel like he fails to meet his full potential. Well, for one thing, you can use him as long as you have any amount of Dark Eco stored up rather than having to wait for a full tank. But the more Eco you have, the longer the power-up lasts. But what really shoots up his stock since the last game is that now he can... Open doors. Dark Jack, you know, this ravenous killing machine, has been reduced to being used very situationally to open doors. But I'm not done yet! Dark Jack can also become invisible when he approaches these statues. And you know what? Yeah, while invisibility is a cool ability, it doesn't really fit the whole chaotic, feral, destructive nature Dark Jack encompasses. I think it would work much better for the more graceful Light Jack, represented, of course, by the Light Eco Meter. Light Jack is a fantastic idea, and I'm really glad they included it to close out the trilogy, as it ties things in nicely with the end of the first game. Ah! The concept of Jack reclaiming some of his light side to balance out the darkness injected in 2 is an idea that writes itself. As Light Jack, you can slow down time, which you only use in the level you unlock it in, and never again. And what makes this even stranger is that there were actually a couple times you logically could have integrated this new power, but instead we got Daxter monkey bar sections. Oh yeah, so before I get on with the rest of the Light Jack stuff, you indeed get to play as Daxter more here too. Again, primarily in monkey bar sections, though, which is pretty disappointing. But even when you're on the ground, things aren't much better because his jumping arc comes down so violently fast, it's hard even for the camera to keep up with him, resulting in some pretty frustrating deaths until you get used to it. Back to Light Jack, though, he also gets a shield ability, which you will never, ever use because you get regeneration before that anyway. So why would I waste my Light Eco on a shield when I can just restore myself to full health when that runs low? Could replace that shield with invisibility. The final power you obtain towards the end of the game is light flight and 
Okay, this one's actually pretty cool. You acquire most Lightjack abilities gradually in the reoccurring Precursor Monk Temple that I mentioned earlier, which you find out about through Seam, who is a Precursor Monk. Seam says that this big light in the sky is basically Armageddon approaching, and we later find out that said light is a Dark Maker ship. The Dark Makers are an ancient alien race of Precursors who have been tainted with Dark Eco. They've apparently battled with the Precursors for ages over the fate of countless other planets, and this one is their next target. I really love these guys' designs. They look awesome. They kind of remind me of the monsters from Amnesia the Great War- Okay, who the fuck is gonna get that reference, dude? The first time we really confront a Dark Maker, not counting that boring minigame, is out in the desert when we have to battle this satellite after recovering a Dark Eco Crystal from a dead wastelander we were sent out to rescue. And it was pretty tough. It starts off creating this ring of electricity around you before slamming into the sand, sending shockwaves across the ground as well as whipping out its tentacles. Great, now I'm horny. When it does this, it's the only time it's vulnerable to attack. Weirdly enough, there's no health bar here unlike all the other bosses in the game, only a time limit, so yeah, just keep doing this till it's dead. On another mission out in the desert, Ashlyn finds Jack and begs him to come back to the city. However, because he's still bitter about being exiled, understandably refuses to return to Helphaven in the war. But this is also basically saying, fuck Kira, fuck Seamus, fuck Sig, fuck Torn, fuck Ashlyn, fuck It's not like they're the ones who chose to throw you out, you jack off. <laughs> but a half hour later, we're sneaking back into Haven City anyway. But this isn't about saving his Haven friends because Jack says later on, forget about it. I've got my own interest in this. And we know it's not about saving the world, so what exactly are those interests? Well, on the bright side, sneaking back into Haven is quite possibly my favorite sequence of missions in the entire franchise. You unlock a door at the Monk Temple using the Seal of Mar that Ashlyn brought you, and she even brought you your hoverboard which returns here. It wasn't used all that much in Jack 2, but it feels like it gets more shine here, and maybe it's just me, but it seems to control better? And your jetboard won't attach to the fucking wheel! Oh yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. This area of the Monk Temple is perfect for zipping around on the jetboard and grinding above pits. There's some great platforming and nice puzzle segments putting your new time freezing abilities to the test. Then you take an elevator deep into the earth to find this huge precursor tunnel and this snazzy ass car, leading into a really cool driving segment. Emerging from the other side of the catacombs brings you to Haven City's eco mining system. Oh, and you get that worthless shield before you head up to it. Here you have to navigate the mine by leading a cart full of explosives down the track on a time crunch, eliminating metalheads and zipping along with your jet board before <laughs> Just as we're about to make it back into Haven, we run into Count Vinegar. It's Vega! He explains that these subrails run deep into the very core of the planet, where the precursors await to bestow unimaginable powers among the worthy. And he wishes to be granted those powers so that he may be the one to save the world from this incoming evil. He also reveals that he actually attacked the palace himself so that it would provide quick access to the precursor catacombs below Haven. Vigilance. It's Vega, you idiot! Wants to erase all dark eco in the world and replace it with nothing but light eco. And considering that Jack is pumped full of dark eco, explains why exactly he wants to be rid of Jack beyond the selfish motivations of exiling the best chance of survival the planet has for the sake of being a simple glory hog. Using his magic staff, Veger- Veger! It's Veger, you idiot! Oh. You got it right that time. Summons a precursor robot like it's Jack 1 all over again, and this fight was pretty- Radical! It begins with the robot slinging shockwaves straight at you and then swinging lasers across the floor that you have to hop over before sending out these weird bug things. Then he builds pillars for you to jump on, how nice of him, where you use the morph gun to release carts of explosives to dump on him from above. This was a kick-ass fight besides the part where he helps you out, but other than that, yeah, it kicked my ass! We emerge from the subrails and make our way across town to a barrier separating us from Samo. He instructs us to head through the sewers to find a way around the force field put up by Vigor to get in touch with Torn. Oh, and, uh, Kira's there too, but she doesn't say anything. Just, uh, just kind of looks at you like- So we head into the sewers, and around this point of the game is where the music really started to hit its stride for me. While I don't find Jack 3's soundtrack to be particularly memorable, much like Jack 2's, it does still find an identity. Jack 2's was this gritty, edgy, and at times heavy-hitting affair, whereas Jack 3 tends to be more mysterious, majestic, and even whimsical, almost like a balance in tone between the sound of Jack 1 and 2. Unlike Jack 1 and 2's soundtracks, however, Jack 3, to my slight disappointment, doesn't feature any dynamic music. Nothing changes when you pull out your weapon or use your hoverboard or anything unlike before. A small criticism, but still an absence of attention to detail that I think another year of development time definitely could have aided. Once we emerge from the sewers, we're ready to aid Torn in the war against the coexisting metalheads and KG deathbots. And it's nice to see that Torn still hates Dax as much as ever. Plus, I kind of like the sign with the Otzel head outside. Yeah, it's cool, huh? We use it for target practice. Hey! But from here, it's 
kind of just like Jack 2 all over again for like three hours. It's fun, don't get me wrong, but I feel like I'm playing Jack 2 DLC right now rather than Jack 3. That doesn't mean there's nothing noteworthy here though. There is this cool mission where you have to guide a missile as Daxter to take down this barrier that's pretty fun, and there's a Pac-Man ripoff, and it's unironically the hardest mission in the game. So the final mission before proceeding with the third act involves you flying up to the KG Deathbot factory and destroying it. The part where you have to take out the factory's exterior defenses is kind of blank because the ship steers way too hard. Like like, why does this feel so much later to drive than a little zoomer? Where this mission gets really good, though, is once you're inside, disposing of every KG bot in sight. With the best part coming at the end, where you hijack this car and wreck shit all throughout the ship. It's so good. At the top of the factory, you finally confront the leader of the killer contraptions, Errol, who explains that... Wait, 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 wait. Errol? The Errol? That Errol? <laughs> so he actually revealed himself over transmission before this, and yeah, now he's back thanks to being rebuilt by the KG Deathbots and is now commanding them. And as you can see, he's gone a bit insane because of that explosion. <laughs> Cyber Errol wants to erase all light eco and destroy the world with the help of the Dark Makers, who he somehow digitally contacted and forged an alliance with. The parallels between him and Veeger are really interesting. Veeger wants to purify the world of dark eco to save the planet, whereas Errol wants to be rid of light eco to destroy it. That's really cool, unlike his lame ass boss fight. Errol throws bombs down from the platform above, and KG Deathbots and Dark Makers attempt to attack. Once they all clear, you have to smack a bomb underneath the platform Errol is standing on and do that four times. I mean, almost all the boss battles since Claw took me half a dozen attempts, and then this one was just one and done. Pretty disappointing. And to make things worse, it's all for naught as he escapes anyway. Luckily, we're right on his tail as we chase him through the portal and end up back at HQ. Where is Errol? This game makes no sense! So now Errol and the Dark Makers are attacking the Monk Temple back in the Wasteland. When we meet Seem at the end thanks to our new flight ability, Seem grants us the time map and says something really odd to Daxter. Yes, I was granted the gift of seeing the face of my creators. Thank you, little one. Uh, okay. Back in Spargus, the Dark Makers have started attacking the city, but these guys ain't nothing compared to what's out on the water because we've got these giant ass War of the Worlds looking things hurling bombs at us. And while this mission would be really cool considering the scale of these awesome creatures, it's not because the turret doesn't fire automatically. You have to manually press R1 over and over, my poor finger! Now that that's over with Dame <sighs> Christ. Uh, look. Damus explains that he was once the head of Haven City, but Baron Praxis said, Sight! Damus gives Jack his final battle amulet and explains that it's a beacon which can call for backup at any time. And Damus also gives us a chest plate of Mars and says that he was saving it for his lost son, but that Jack needs it more right now. Eventually, we storm the new Metalhead Nest and confront Errol at the top because Errol leads them too for some reason? Regardless, he's ready to unleash the deadly cargo on the Dark Maker ship and runs away again! Now it's a race to the planet's core to act activate the planetary defense system, as it's the only way to stop the Dark Maker ship. To get there, we'll have to traverse the remains of Haven Palace. However, the ruins are infested with metalheads, so Jack decides he can maybe use some backup. Unfortunately, the communicator doesn't seem to be working, so the duo charge forward anyway. And this whole final sequence of the game is right up there as the highlight of the whole adventure for me, along with sneaking into Haven. It's so cool reminiscing on what these areas used to be, like the old racing stadium. And being able to actually explore the wreckage is a treat. Just as Jack and Daxter seem ready to meet their end at the hand of Darkmaker satellites, Damus suddenly burst through the rubble in a massive buggy taking them all out, and then head for the Precursor Catacombs together. It's so cool finally seeing them work as a team, and it's awesome how much closer they've grown since they first met. It's a pretty, uh... I hate to use this word unironically, epic sequence with mortars crashing from above, all the while pummeling your way through doors and dark makers in the thunder and lightning. Sadly, Damus reaches his end thanks to one of the bombs raining from above, causing their car to flip and Damus to be caught underneath. In his last moments, Damus pleads with Jack to find his son, Mar. Damus shows Jack the seal of Mar, and Jack realizes that it's of course the same one his younger self had, so we now know that Jack is Damus' son. Or that's what I would have said if it weren't so unbelievably obvious that Damus was Jack's father. You did very well, Jack. You make me proud that our training program is so good. You have a reputation for being rash. Didn't your father ever tell you to pick your battles wisely? I didn't know my father. My point is, I mustn't lose you. Like I lost 
my son. But the moment still works remarkably well, not because of the surprise, but because of the genuine fondness I grew towards Damus as a character. Seeing how untrusting of Jack he was in the beginning, but then watching him open up to him more, becoming a father figure to Jack, trying to fill the void left by the loss of his son, it's pretty touching. What really makes this whole thing moving for me though, is that while we all knew Jack was Damus' son, or I'm sure most people knew, tragically Damus dies in Jack's arms before finding out that truth. Yes, you were that child. I took you from Damus, hoping to harness your eco powers for my experiments. Then I lost you to the underground. You seem upset. Did I tell you too late? You were the son of the great warrior Damus. Oh, and he never knew. How delightful. Ah, bigger! Thank you for opening the door to the precursors. Don't worry, I'll be back to put you out of your misery. After him, Jack! You're willing to go down there? Without a fuss this time. Yeah, well, don't get used to it. It's just that nobody hurts my best friend and lives to brag about it. I love how Jack momentarily rages into his dark form. Vigor's voice actor does a wonderful job of being a snotty prick. And it was great how Daxter puts aside his cowardice to stick up for his best friend. Fantastic scene all around. Ah, okay, honestly, that was kind of funny. But... I think I love the next scene even more. So we chase after Vigor through the Precursor tunnels and power up the planetary defense system. As a Precursor is about to turn Jack into one as a reward for his heroism, Vigor emerges from the shadows and hogs the honor for himself. When suddenly... <laughs> If you had been a true hero, you would have stopped Errol by now. Oh my god. Holy fucking shit. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, this got spoiled for me, but this was still amazing! I know people are pretty mixed about this decision, but I loved it, even if it makes zero sense. We now know the Dark Eco blows people up, Dissolves people, corrupts people, makes people precursors, corrupts precursors. So wait, if Daxter came in contact with more, would he become a dark maker? I don't know, but I don't care. This flips the whole series on its head and brings the franchise full circle back to its lighthearted roots. The beginning of the franchise opened with this question. Who were the precursors and why did they vanish? And it turns out there's been one here the whole time. Look at the reactions. Look at Veger's face. Veger becomes the very rat he despised. Cleaver almost ate a fucking precursor. I love this twist. I love this scene so, so much. So while everybody hopes that the defense system activates in time, the precursors send Jack to the Dark Maker ship to stop Errol himself, just in case to make sure he can't unleash the cargo. Right as the duo confront Errol, the weapon fires a blast straight through the ship, and Errol escapes again in this weird terraformer thing. Jack and Daxter escape the ship as well through a portal at the end of this corridor and are greeted by the monstrous mechanism trampling the wasteland. The grand scale of this final boss is incredible. This thing is absolutely gargantuan. You have to use the sand shark's bullets to destroy the gems on its legs as you chase it all throughout the desert, and some of these gems are pretty hard to hit. The war still isn't over yet, though, because once you take out its legs, you now have to climb the core of the machine to reach a goddamn mechanical dragon at the top. So you've got to get rid of these tentacle things. I'm horny again. And also, these weird shits are back, and you have to avoid these lasers until you can shoot the dragon in the back of the head. It all sounds pretty crazy, but honestly, it's not the hardest boss in the world world, but the atmosphere and scale make up for the lack of difficulty, resulting in a fantastic finale. Seriously, I know I've given this game a lot of flack, but god damn what an ending- Wait, what? What are they kissing for? I thought- But she- Why? Why? Afterwards, everybody's gathered back at the Spargus Arena and the Precursors thank everyone for saving the world. Jack asked the Precursors that they refer to him as Mar as his father intended, and I thought that was really neat. Wait, Jack is Mar? The Mar? Wait, what do you mean, THE Mar? Damus says he's part of the lineage with the House of Mar. We find armor from THE Mar that Damus was saving to give to his son. How could this kid also be THE Mar? Like... 
Ugh, Naughty Dog, why do you insist on overcomplicating things? Jack decides to leave with the precursors to see the universe or something, but before he does, they offer to fulfill any wish Daxter desires for his heroism. So he decides to get those pants he's always wanted. You know how it lifts and cradles? <sighs> you wouldn't understand. And his Jif decides that she wants pants like that too. So she also gets turned into a not so- Wait, have I mentioned her at all? You're such an- Animal. You know what? It's this weird bestiality romance going on. It's probably the best we don't bring it up. Meanwhile, the other new Otzel Vigor is now Cleaver's sidekick. Jack somehow teleports behind Daxter and credits roll. Anybody else feel like they're getting ready to receive their diploma with this music? Oh man, and here I thought my head hurt beating Jack too. I don't even know where to begin recapping this one. The main overarching problem with Jack 3 is a general lack of polish and refinement that was present in other games. And considering Jack 3 had half the development time those titles had, that is perfectly understandable. But unfortunately, I gotta critique this for what it is and not what it could have or should have been. First off, the sound design. There is no more dynamic music or hell, sometimes there is no sound at all. Not even some wind or ambient cave noise or something. Like, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big a deal because the dynamic music is just a bit of seasoning and the other is so minute in scale that it might as well not even be worth mentioning. But again, it's just a standard that the other games had in check that this one unfortunately couldn't reach thanks to its rushed creation. The bosses as a whole were pretty good, but even they didn't touch what Jack 2 had for us. Just like the real issue here, the writing. Cause my lord is it sloppy. I mean, Jack 2 can get a little confused Using, it definitely was my first time playing, but it never felt messy. We know why we're here, what our goal is, as well as the role everybody plays in their necessity to the plot, ultimately leading Jack 2 to a satisfying definitive conclusion. But let's be real, Jack 3 kinda renders all of that pointless. So we free Haven City from the tyrannical rule of Baron Praxis, only to have them fall right back under the heel of someone else, but... Count Viger. I hereby dissolve the city council and strip you of your title, command, and all privileges. Then again, not really? Killing the metalhead leader was all for nothing because the metalheads just survive anyway? It'd be one thing if there were only those cool ass dinosaurs in the wasteland since they're far away from all the stuff back in Haven kind of doing their own thing, but nope, they're all back full force. But all right, all right, we just blew up their new nest. So now they're done, right? Maybe not because there's still some just chilling in the palace wreckage. So who's to say they won't just rise up again? They did it once already. Why are they in the story anyway? To justify Jack getting thrown out? I mean, Viger was so obsessed with Jack being this dark eco-freak, I'm sure that could have been reason enough for him to banish him. And Errol is basically the leader of the KG, Metalheads, and Dark Makers? I can understand the KG being here because they're the ones that rebuilt Errol, and sure, I guess I can buy Errol being able to sympathize with the Dark Makers because of you know. But there's just too much going on here. You can take out the metalheads from the plot and it works fine. It's not like they have a goal here anyway. They're just generic enemies now. Just focus on the dark makers, please. The Horicon's fate, as well as everyone else's, was all wrapped up very nicely in Jack 2. And while there are some plot that's concluded neatly here as well, like Damus' story and, well, maybe neatly is not the right word, but satisfying to me finding out the precursor's true identities, other stuff just seems to get left behind or forgotten about. So it only feels like a portion of the story was resolved by the end, which is disappointing for a series whose lore was so tightly woven and treated with such care prior. And seriously, what the hell happened to Kira? Fuck me! She was Jack's love interest the first two games and all of a sudden they shoehorn Ashlyn in? Like why? Who wanted this? Take your scaly ass back to Torn. And because of this bitch, now I don't know if Jack is supposed to be THE Mar or not. Why would you even say that? While the shoddy writing is impossible for me to ignore, the gameplay here is the saving grace because there's at least nothing so offensively bad gameplay wise that makes me actively not enjoy playing. In fact, I'd even say there's a lot of areas where the gameplay is an improvement. Unlike Spyro 3, which had an abundance of bullshit and 2, count it, 
two shit endings, and yes, I'm still mad about it. So it definitely helps that despite everything, Jack 3 sticks to landing pretty solidly. Excluding this broad. God damn it, I keep getting sidetracked. Sure, the cars are all lubed up, but it's manageable for the most part, and even kind of funny, and overall, I really enjoy their inclusion. Different vehicles serving different purposes along with the different weapons is a nice way to spice things up. And speaking of the driving, thank God the hubs aren't so cramped like Jack 2's Haven City. And yes, the weapons do go a bit overboard a bit, probably putting it nicely. Like I said, they're still really damn fun. And even if these weren't used much, Dark and Light Jack are still fun for what they're worth. The jet board was way more fun this time around, and the soundtrack was pretty solid. Maybe even the best in the trilogy. And I'd probably have to say this game has the best humor in the trilogy too. Don't make me come down there from these perch. I got a perch for you, birdie, right here. Twirler. <laughs> That's it. This could have been the best game in the series as Jack 3 really does build upon a lot of the already great things Jack 2 did while also carving its own path. And from that aspect, it certainly deserves a ton of praise. For as much fun as the game is to play, however, I just can't look past the goddamn writing. And I do sympathize with Naughty Dog not just over that, but all the game's flaws because they were clearly pressed for time. Even though it does still somehow close the trilogy on a relatively high note, Sad to say, as a whole product, it taints the legacy its predecessors left behind.